Welcome again to these educational modules. This is actually going to be the last one. And I thought I would, at this point, kind of summarize the fractures that often are missed. So we went through the others, which are very obvious, but what we need to do is the fractures that are missed. And actually, that's probably not a good word. Probably a better politically or legally term would be what? Uh, unappreciated. Very good. <laughs> fractures about the elbow that are often unappreciated. Okay, so what's the reason for using unappreciated besides missed? It, uh... Well, here, we'll, we'll, we'll show you. If you use missed, you're often, this could be the outcome, you know. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, because this orthopedic surgeon missed the proper diagnosis, this boy will be crippled forever, and that will cost $10 million, and the uh, jury agrees. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll discuss, that's why you should say missed, because um, a miss, I mean, you should say unappreciated, because that can occur anyway, and whereas missed means that you're liable, that you didn't do it right. Okay, so it's really important to remember that one of the principal reasons that these fractures are missed, oh, excuse me, unappreciated, is it's a failure to understand or forget that in treating fractures in the pediatric age group, one has to keep in mind that children's fractures are unique. The normal child is not a miniature adult, and the differences are due to what? The growing. That's exactly bone. right. Very good. The bones are, there has to be some kind of mechanism to allow the bones to grow. And they also have different biomechanical characteristics. So, what situations can contribute to fractures in the pediatric group in which they're unappreciated? In the fracture that goes through the Pisces. Well, actually, that can be a, usually is appreciated. So, you know, one of the things is failure to appreciate the normal ossification process of the distal humerus. That's something that you probably, hopefully, you learned or you probably didn't in the first year in anatomy, but it's always been emphasized in orthopedics, and you folks are very long, so you need to, you know, I'm sure you know that. And you fade also, there are some unusual fracture patterns that can occur around the elbow. And what is, this is one of the big ones, and we'll discuss this in detail, focusing treatment on the obvious major fracture and not really checking for the minor fractures that may be ipsilateral type of fractures. And also fair to appreciate some of the late uh, effects of the fractures. And we actually went through those in the other previous modules. So now we're going to discuss the above conditions that lead to not appreciating these some fractures. Okay, what situations contribute to the fractures in the elbow being unappreciated? What's unique about the elbow? Uh, there's multiple different physes. That's right. They're things. actually epiphyses, and it's fair to appreciate the normal ossification process of the distal humerus. So, how do the centers of ossification and growing bones appear at the different ages? Well, this is the normal ossification of all the bones. It starts here in the primary ossification center. What's next? Secondary ossification. That's right. And that may be delayed in some of them. Sometimes if there's no secondary ossification center, you may not appreciate that there's a separate, as you said, through the physis because you don't see that that's cartilage and has a different radiographic density. And so then you have this, and what's next? Well, now the bone is actually, instead of just an ossification center, it's becoming a bone. And of course, the final one is where you have the bone, but you still have the so-called epiphyseal plate or physis right here. You'll see this. So that's the, the, the late stage that you see by 
at least a year or two years of age, as you see then. So this lack of ossification center makes recognitions of the fracture patterns different. And you mentioned especially true in the distal humerus. What's, what's the ossification pattern up to a year? Um, well, there's no ossification. Yeah. So what's next? What's the first one to develop? And it's at two to three years, or two to four years. Capitola. Yes, right, the lateral condyle, or the capitellum. And what's the next one? Radial head, sir. Well, we're talking about the distal oh, humerus. Sorry. Uh, it's actually the medial epicondyle. Medial and now it's really, this one doesn't, this is a real problem, because this one doesn't develop until they're nine, eight or nine years. And which one is that? Trochlea. Trochlea, yeah. Or the medial condyle. And then by 10 to 12 years, they actually have the lateral epicondyle, which often some of the emergency room doctors will interpret as a fracture. And then at 13 years, they should have complete ossification, although the physis is still there. So, in this area, we see what are described as trash injuries. Does anybody know what trash injuries are? I don't. No. It's not like this kind of trash. It's that the radiographic appearance seems harmless. So you may have some that you miss it and everything, or you think, or you just um, discard it and say, um, well, that's not really important and so forth. And so these are so-called trash injuries. And these are the ones that will get you in trouble sometimes. So the pre differential injuries of the distal humerus, what do you see in the normal elbow? What's the alignment? Well, you have a normal radial capitellar alignment in the distal humerus. It's not displaced in the distal humerus is, a, is aligned with the capitellum in the normal position, just lateral to it. What about dislocation of the elbow? What, how's the alignment? It's off. Which usually? It's, uh, it's usually displaced uh, laterally. That's correct, yeah. So the proximal radius and ulna are posterior lateral, and the proximal radius is no longer aligned with the capitellum. What about fractures of the lateral condyle? The lateral condyle usually displaces. Yes, right. The alignment of the lateral condyle, which way does it go? It would go lateral. Yes, right. So the lateral condyle is displaced lateral and has lost its alignment with the capitellum. And this one here, this is a supracondylar fracture. What's the, what's the alignment of the elbow, of the distal humerus? Uh, it's usually an, uh, anterior to the... Um, yeah, well actually the relationship usually though of the radial capitellar and the, hum and the ulnar capitellar joint is not disrupted. So you may, your disruption displacement is in the supracondylar area and the fracture line is irregular and proximal. But there's still normal radiographic capitellar alignment. So what's this one? Total distal physis. What is the alignment here? The alignment still would probably be normal. Well, it's, yeah, somewhat normal. It, it, the alignment of the, you're right, the alignment of the joint is still intact. And that, that's a very important key, so that the total distal humerus is displaced usually posterior medial, whereas lateral condyles are posterior lateral, anterior lateral. And that's the difference here. So the total distal fragment is displaced posterior medial, and the normal radial capital alignment is maintained. And as we'll discuss here, later on this is the type that's mostly unappreciated it's a rare injury you don't see many of them but it's mostly uh, unappreciated and you need to appreciate it because the treatment is totally different than the lateral condyle or dislocated elbow okay here's a case that demonstrates the importance of knowing the normal ossification process this is a two-day-old infant is referred for possible DDH from an orthopedist in a neighboring small town. It was a difficult breach delivery requiring considerable pulling force 
to deliver the baby. The pediatrician discovered a thigh shortening on the right hip with pain on the abduction of the right hip, and he sent you to manage her DDH. There was thought this was DDH. What's the next thing you would do? I'd want to examine the patient first. Yeah, well, it's short, and, but it's a little bit painful. Well, next thing you want to do? Uh, you know, you, you have a pre presumptive diagnosis, and then the purpose of an x-ray is to confirm, confirm the diagnosis. diagnosis. That's right. So that's why you need to do an exam first. And so you know that there's some displacement of the hip because the, the uh, knee is proximal, and that's called Galeazzi sign, and that's very common in dislocated hips. So, do you remember about all of the lines and so forth? Is this hip, what's your assessment of these radiographic images? On the left side, you don't have the ossific nucleus yet, but from what it looks, it looks like it is below Hilgenreiner's line. Yeah, it's actually, that's Hilgenreiner's actually line. the right side. Right. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. I mean on the, yeah, on the, the arm means right. So, yeah, you draw these lines, what's, what's disrupted here? That Shitman's line. Very good. And you talked about the Hilton, Hilgenreiner's line. Where is the proximal medial metaphysis of the humerus, I mean, the uh, femur is supposed to be? It's supposed you know? to be medial to yeah. Hilgen's line. Yeah, the significance of these lines, normally it should be in that quadrant. So this patient has a dislocated hip, so you're going to put it in the pavlik, or what are you going to do? Uh, what else is different? What's different here? Well, this patient has swelling, and is tender. Is that, have you seen many DDHs? Uh, a few. Yeah, are they tender? No. They, yeah, they usually they'll cry a little bit, mainly just from being handled, but they, they usually are not tender, not so. sore. This one was quite tender with swelling. So what's next step? When, how do you, what's next to confirm your diagnosis? You can get an ultrasound of the hip. Yeah, that's right. Well, what you need to know is the unique anatomy of the proximal femur. What's unique about the proximal femur in a um, nine-month-old or a year-old? The blood supply? Well, yes, but what else? Structurally. Well, in that age, the, it's a common epiphysis, hasn't separated. So, the femoral head and the greater trochanter have a common epiphysis. And so the failure of this, if there's a fracture, occurs at this common physeal line. So the rem femoral head remains reduced, but the part that's displaced is this proximal metaphysis here, which actually the greater trochanter, but you don't see that because this patient hasn't started a phosphication center, which usually doesn't occur until the, uh, <clears throat> well, they're about 10 months old, or 12 months old. And as they grow, then they separate, so that if you have a fracture, it will then separate, and it uh, may involve the head, or may involve the avulsion of the trochanter. But as they grow, this, this uh, previous physis remains as a thick band. And so with growth, the epiphysis and the apophysis separate. And so there you can see that it's either fractured or dislocated because it still as a unit, whereas in the infant, it has been separated as a unit, as you can see it here. So you, you said you could do uh, ultrasound. And that is possible, but not many uh, orthopedic surgeons can can interpret arthrograms. I mean, of ultrasound. The simplest way is to do an arthrogram. And here's the arthrogram. What do you expect to see? Where's the if you move it around, you rotate it. Where's the in a hip? Where does it rotate? In a normal hip, where does it rotate? between the femoral head and the acetabulum? Well, yeah, but in the normal, it's in the acetabulum. If you rotate it, the head rotates in the acetabulum. But if you disrupted that proximal thing, where's it gonna rotate? Through the femoral neck? Yeah, well, actually through that common physis, really. 
And what you do is it'll, you can see it under an image intensifier. You can see that there is a, a marked rotation and it occurs there at the physeal uh, line, which is the common is the common physis of the trochanter and the radial head, femoral head, but there's no ossification of either one of these. So, here you go. <clears throat> you confirm your diagnosis. How are you going to treat it? You're going to put a big blade plate on it? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to put a, a, a big a nail with a, uh, with a uh, uh, <laughs> what do you call that in the adult? Those nails. The <coughs> cephalomedullary nails? Yeah, cephalomedullary nails. <laughs> yeah, what are you going to do? You probably still treat it in a pavlik. Yeah, right. A, tr a pavlik is very good. Uh, it's a very simple way of treating it. And when you, you can see here, now it's treated and in the pavlik, and you can see that this is uh, normal alignment here. And this will heal very, very rapidly. So the pavlik, the fracture is reduced and you keep them in the pavlik for a couple of weeks, then you can take them out of it and it'll heal very rapidly. All right, a lot of these fractures patterns that occur around the apple and they're not appreciated. Okay, so here's a female resident, Dr. Jane Jones. Um, and she calls her staff Dr. John Smith and describes the fracture of the distal humerus in a five-year-old female. And he, she's just examined, she's in the emergency room, and so she calls Dr. Smith, who happens to be in the clinic, or actually in, in church, and here's what she describes. And she says, Dr. Smith, I'm seeing this five-year-old female, which what I believe has a displaced medial epicondyle of her right distal humerus. Is she right? Well, you need to understand the ossification process. What's still lacking on ossification in a five-year-old? You, you said it's the medial, medial condyle or the trochlea, right. So, all she needs is to be placed in a long arm cast for three weeks. And so Dr. Smith responds, well, Dr. Jones, that sounds like a good plan. You do what's best. Now you're a big girl now. She's in a senior. She's a big girl. So the patient comes back in the clinic and has her cast removed, as Dr. Uh, Jones has said. And, uh-oh, what's going on? Well, this time there's some changes around the fragment. And there's now has developed some ossification of the adjacent apophysis. So, what is this fracture? Did she make the right diagnosis? No. Did Dr. Jones' original diagnosis? Does that change it? And Dr. Who is it, Dr. Smith? Smith. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Smith. He's got some choice comments for Dr. Jones. <coughs> Oops, Dr. Jones, you goofed. This is a fracture of the unossified medial condyle. I mean, that needs to have an open reduction and pin fixation. So get on, get organized and get it done. So she does. She goes to the emergency room in the operating room and under the supervision of the senior resident and they do an open reduction. She put her in an open reduction. Oh my Lord here. It comes back two years later, the child comes she leaves the pins in for three weeks and thinks that's enough. She tells them to come back if they have any problem. And sure enough, this patient comes back at two years because he's got poor, poor function. So, what's the teaching point here? If you have a... Know the ossification. Yeah, time. right. Well, how often do you see medial epicondyles in a five-year-old? Medial epicondyles are usually associated with dislocations, which usually occur in the second decade. You don't, it's very rare to see them in the first decade. If you have that displacement, it's usually a distal humeral physis rather than the other. So the key point, medial epicondyle fractures before the age of 10 
when the trochlea ossifies has appeared is a medial condyle fracture until you prove it otherwise. And how would you prove it if you saw, like, poor Dr. Jones here? Arthrogram? Yeah, you would do it the best way is an arthrogram diagnosis. If you want to be real expensive, you could do a, a, a MRI, but you know, that's pretty expensive. But you can do it very simple with an arthrogram. So, this is, we go here. So, this is developing this. So, why does this occur? Is it because Dr. Jones missed the diagnosis? No, excuse me, the unappreciated the diagnosis. This was probably the result of the development of avascular necrosis of the trochlea ossification center, which probably was the result of the original fracture and not necessarily Dr. Jones' initial, sorry, unappreciated diagnosis. Yeah, unappreciated, lack of appreciation <laughs> of the true nature of the fracture site. Okay, why does avascular necrosis occur in the distal humerus, do you know? How about you, do you know? Well, there's a very unique blood supply to two separate ossification centers. There are two separate ossification centers in the distal humerus. There's one that's a transepiphyseal artery, and it comes from the supracondylar area, and it penetrates, lies right on the surface of the physeal metaphyseal junction of the distal humeral physis. At this point, of course, the lateral condyle is, is ossified, but there is, an, uh, there is a physio, common physeal line here, and there's a, me so that one gets this medial ossification center, the second one is an extra articular one, and that gets the lateral, that gets this lateral ossification center. So, if you have a, a disruption there, if you have a distal humeral physeal injury or a lateral medial condyle fracture, especially a medial condyle fracture, these vessels are very uh, uh, at risk of being ruptured, and you then you get os you get distal. I mean, you get um, <clears throat> avascular necrosis of the secondary ossification centers. But there's two types. Do you know what they are? This is a rare, as you can see, avascular necrosis of the trochlea is rare. You've probably never seen one, have you? I yeah. have not, not in the Yeah, not so it, it's pretty rare. And there are really two types, and it depends on which vessel is disrupted. If it's a type A, then you have this disruption of the, the lateral physeal, lateral ossification center, and that disappears, and it's a localized avascular necrosis, and it forms what you call a fishtail deformity. And this is what you'll see very commonly. If it's a type B, it will do all of them, and when that occurs, that is a pretty malignant deformity with a progressive, it should be, you know, cubitus varus. It's a progressive cubitus varus. But that one is, a, is very difficult and, and much more malignant. This just gives them a little stiffness, but this one, they'll lose some motion. And you need to understand those and you need to tell the parents that, and you really can't tell this until it heals. And you can see what happens as far as the medial ossification center. So, here's another distal humerus fracture that's often not appreciated. Okay, this is an unappreciated fracture. And this one was called by the resident, talked to the staff man, talked to Dr. Smith and said, I've got a type 2 fracture of the lateral condyle. Do you agree? I, I would <laughs> disagree. Yeah, why? What's, what's, so maybe you're right. You need to really examine the structure more closely. So what's, why do you disagree? What in the structure that is that? It's in the trochlea. Yeah, it's a trochlea. Actually, it's a trochlea or another one is at this age, it can be what else besides the trochlea? A little bit in, in the trochlea, you don't get that much displacement. Like a total Yeah, right. Epiphyseal. And what is it that makes it a total distance? What's been maintained? 
the radial capitular alignment. And it's retained on both views. Mm -hmm. And here's the other key. The distal fragment is actually posterior medial. And lateral condyle fractures, where do they shift? Lateral, yeah, so in the lateral condyle, you have lost your lateral stability, and they usually go lateral, whereas in the distal humeral physis, and I'm not sure I understand why, they almost all are posterior medial, and that, that's a real clue. The two things that tell you this is the distal humeral physis is that you have the, the radial capitular line is maintained, and that approximately the distal part of the of the elbow joint, the radius and ulna are posterior medial. So this was a true diagnosis of distal humeral physis. And this one is ossification and it can be main it can be checked, you know, diagnosed made e very easily. So the trochlea is not ossified at this age. So the key finding is that the proximal radius is always aligned with the capitellum there. All right, this is a distal humeral physis you know, uh, about a six week old and the parents come in and <clears throat> they say, you know, he's been hurting now for three days and how did it occur? He fell out of bed. Do you believe that story? No, sir. Yeah, so what's going on here? Same thing. Yeah. It's posterior, posterior medial. medial. And remember that the, the distal humerus is somewhat unossified at this age. And this is the, the normal side that you see. It does have some ossification. But here the capitellum is a little bit posterior. It's hidden, and so it's hard to see. So you, you see that displaced posterior immediately. So if they're a little bit older child, how can you pin them? You need you know, lateral condyles that are type 3 displaced are almost obligatory open reduction. And does this patient need to schedule for an open reduction? Uh, no, but you need to be prepared to do it. Yeah, right. It's, I tell you, it's kind of difficult to do it because it's a big fragment there and it's very distal. So usually it will reduce, you know, you can manipulate it just like a supracondylar fracture. Although you need to do a little bit more lateral motion because it's posterior medial. And then you confirm it with a, a arthrogram. And once you've confirmed that it's reduced and it's not intraarticular, then you do it just like a supracondylar fracture. You pin it with two or three uh, cross pins. So you need to secure it just like a supracondylar fracture. Now, this is the patient that's four months old. Again, fell out of bed and he's not running, not walking, and he fell out of bed. And your first priority, again, it's posterior medial, it's difficult to see. So, that's your, you made that diagnosis. What's the next thing that you need to do? Fell out of bed. CPS. Yeah, yeah child protection that's right. services. Well, you need, you, what is that, what evidence you, you you, you don't call CPS if they just have a skeletal skull. survey. That's right. So the posterior first priority is to make the diagnosis of the distal humeral physis. And the second priority is look around. There is a, oh, what's that? Yeah, uh, heel rib. rib yeah, fractures. it's got callus and a rib and a fractured rib. And like you say, you do a skeletal survey. And if you, the skeletal survey, you can't see it, but this patient had uh, multiple rib fractures and also had a skull fracture here, right through here. So the message is distal humeral physal fractures usually are due to non extra trauma until proven otherwise, if they're not walking. Now if they're walking, it's a little different situation because they can run and put a pressure on and this can occur. But if they're not ambulating, they're not running down and falling and so forth and so Usually the only way it can occur is some kind of twisting motion, and that, of course, occurs with non-accidental trauma. So here's another example. We had this uh, about a year ago, and this one, the resident, one of your colleagues, called and said, 
we've got a type 3 lateral condyle fracture. Is that, and I think we need to get prepared for an open reduction. What do you think? It goes through the capitellum. Yeah. So the initial diet was a type 3 displaced lateral condyle and was scheduled for an open reduction, but the distal fragment was able to be reduced with a closed manipulation. And here it's a closed manipulation. Why was that? Because this was the distal humeral physeal injury. And here's the clue. Remember the key to the diagnosis is that it's posterior medial, whereas lateral condyles are usually lateral. And also the radial capitellar alignment has been maintained. So that's the difference here. This one was able to be reduced by close reduction and pin fixation. Whereas if there's a lateral condyle fracture, it's very difficult with a type three to get a closed reduction. And usually those end up having an open reduction. So it was insecured with percutaneous pins. And of course the articular surface being intact was uh, <clears throat> done with an arthrogram as you can see here. Okay, so that confirmed this was a separation of the entire distal epiphysis. Now here's another problem. It's focusing on the treatment on the obvious major fracture and not appreciating other fractures present. So here we got Dr. Frank, and he's a senior resident. He's pretty savvy and sometimes. <laughs> and so he saw this patient, and what's your assessment of the x-ray? He was seen in the emergency room. Doctor said, I think I have a child with a fractured femur, and he took an x-ray, and he said, yes, it's fractured. It's also broken. And so Dr. <clears throat> Frank went immediately to the x-ray and says, you know, you're pretty sharp. <laughs> that is broken. So this occurred in 1973 when I first actually, actually I should be the thing, but when I first was uh, here in, at this university and this resident called me and he said, uh, conducted at me and said he to tell me that the patient had just arrived in the emergency room and this is what he said. Dr. Wilkins, and this is Dr. Jones, I have a 14-year-old boy who has a motorbike accident and sustained his mid-shaft fracture of his right femur. And he's healthy. That's his only injury. And I plan to treat him with skeletal traction using a pin in the proximal fragment. And at that time, skeletal traction was the standard treatment of femoral shaft fractures. And so the response, unfortunately, trusting the resident, and not seeing the patient was, and here we go, our friend Dr. Smith said, okay, sounds okay, go ahead. And he trusted Dr. Frank. So here's the key, lessons learned, you need to recognize your mistakes. And if you do, document what works with them and share them with you. Don't keep making the same mistakes or don't have your friends make the mistake. So, Here's the lesion of Dr. Jones lab, which occurred once again. And here's what Dr. Jones says. You know, don't always believe what the resident tells you. You need to check it out yourself. Because here's what happened when he put the pin in, and <clears throat> he, this had a, a called proximal misfracture. And so what do you think the patient's response was? A very bad, big ouch. Mm -hmm and the parents were quite upset. But if you look real closely, you can see that fracture here, mm -hmm. and you're, you're, you're putting traction on the fracture, not the tibia or the femur. And here you can see. So if you go back to the original injury films, if you look real closely, you can see that fracture. And the other thing, clinically, he had tenderness in the area of the proximal tibia. So what was the mistake he made? He looked at the mid-shaft femur and said... Yeah, he immediately saw, it was Friday afternoon, mm -hmm. it was, he said, medial uh, mid-shaft femur, but at that damn time, skeletal pin, and so he made that decision because he went directly, you know, the emergency room said, 
she's got a fractured femur and Dr. Frank went and said, you're right, he's got a fractured femur and immediately started putting in his mind how I used to treat fractured femurs at that age in that period of time. And the problem was he did not do a history and physical, a thorough physical exam because this patient had tenderness in the proximal tibia and if he had done that, he would have maybe picked that up. Here's some other examples of focusing only on the initial injury. So here he, he's in the ER and the ER doctor says, this ER doctor thinks he's pretty smart. And he says, this seven-year-old fell off the monkey bars and presented to a swollen right forearm. And he said, let me show you the x-rays. And his doctor, so he said, it appears he has a green stick fracture of the distal radius. Was, the, was that right? Yeah, that's right. So the, the emergency room doctor, you know, he's pretty smart, yeah. So, what does Dr. Frank do? Uh, what did he do before that? Examine the he, Oh, he did what? Do they still do that nowadays? <laughs> I think so, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So he said, you know, maybe do something like examining the whole patient. And he said, when I examined him, his whole forearm was tender. And so let's get images of the entire forearm. And what do you see here? He said, it pays to examine the patient first. Maybe we ought to have a closer look of the area of the elbow. So what's going on here? What is, what's his lesion here? Does he just need a short arm cast for the distal radius? He needs to be reduced. Yeah, he needs to be reduced and then a long arm cast and treated like a Montasia, right, which is a totally different treatment than just a simple distal radius. And so <clears throat> Dr. Frank says it's obvious he now has a type three lesion and that certainly changes my treatment plan. In the upper extremity, you always, you start at the navicular and you go all the way up to the sternoclavicular joint, you know, if they fall. Because when they fall, all the forces are dissipated, can be dissipated anywhere, and they can be dissipated in more than one place. All right, here we go, another distal radial metaphysis. And how are you gonna treat that? Is that, what type of fracture do we have here? It's just a distal radius. It's a green stick fracture. Yeah. It's a tension yeah, green stick. Take and say your green stick fracture. And so how are you going to treat it? If that's all it is, you can just do a short arm cast. Okay. What else are you going to do? Exactly. Do you have any other concerns? I'd, I'd want to look at the rest of the upper extremity. Yeah. Okay. Can you look elsewhere? What's There's going a scaphoid on? Fracture. That's <laughs> right. That's right. It's not too uncommon to have a scaphoid fracture there and an ipsilateral fracture. Here's some other instances where ipsilateral fractures were appreciated. Here's an ER doctor. He says, this, these monkey bars are treacherous. Here's another seven-year-old with a fracture of the distal radial metaphysis. And uh, Dr. Frank says, I agree with your initial impression. And this is a Peterson 1 physial injury. This is a typical Peterson 1 type physial injury. But when I rotate his forearm, he complains of pain in his elbow. So what's your next approach? Uh, I'd get an x-ray of the uh, forearm and elbow, sir. Yes, right. So let's, let's get images of the entire forearm. So what's going on? Of course, you got a clue. He's got the arrows there. <laughs> so here's what's going on. Yeah, he's got a radial neck fracture. So it's always important to evaluate the entire lower extremity, even if there's pathology in one specific area. And here's our friendly ER doctor again that will lead you astray. And he said, this time I have a 14-year-old track star who's been having pain in his left knee for the last month, and he's got this prominence on his knee. And you get a better view. What's he got? tubercle um, abulsion. Yeah, and what do they call that? Um, what do they call that? Osgood slaughters, I think. He says, the x-rays are typical for Osgood slaughters. Do I need to do any more than have him slow down his activity level? Well, doctor, 
However, now our resident, Dr. Frank, having learned something about initial evaluation, says, on my physical exam, I discovered that he has pain when you rotate his hip. What is, if you have knee pain, what is the rule that you always do? Get a, get you always x-ray. check, you always check, not necessarily get x-rays, but you check to make yeah. sure that there's pain. So, and we need images of his hip. Well, me, our doctor, said, I'm ahead of you this one. Here's an AP of both hips, and they look okay. Are they okay? Mm. Well, he said, that's yeah, stupid ER doctor. He's getting a little tired of working with this emergency <laughs> room doctor. Yeah. Is ignorant. What do you need to do? There's some subtle changes on there. We'll get them a little bit bigger. They're, they're, the differences in the geometry of the epiphysis. This one is normal. This one is a little bit shortened. And also another thing is this is a little bit widened. So, what is that stupid emergency room doctor? What should he have gotten initially? And when you take x-rays, you always get two views. two views, right. And so these don't look too bad. It, um, it's called Klein's line. They barely go through the physis, almost equal. But he said, I guess I'll have to teach him. One always needs two views to determine the true architecture of the proximal femur. So what this patient got? A skiffy. Yeah, a slip capital femoral epiphysis, which really is a, a chronic... Uh, fracture. It's really a, a stress fracture that will eventually uh, separate and get a fracture of the, or dis, dis, a complete separation of the femoral head right through the physis. But here Klein's line does not go through the epiphysis. So the treatment here is again, even though you have obvious pathology you know, with the Osgood Slaughter's disease, always check uh, a little bit farther, always check the hips. So, in evaluating all of joints around, you need to realize there may be a, some associated soft tissue injuries. This is a you know, female injured right elbow and followed by pain and swelling. And she presented to the emergency room with a swollen right elbow and had no other injuries. And you get, you, you examine him, actually the emergency room examined him. And here you see, what do you see? What's, the, what's causing the swelling? Well, you need to get the fat pads displaced, so that tells you that there's some type of fracture in there. And what do we see here? Let's get a bigger view of this. Well, actually, it's a fracture through the, the head. Mm. It's a, actually type 3 physial injury. So here's a bigger view, and you can see there's a fracture of the head. So it's a type three radial head fracture. And so in the emergency room, he was placed in a long arm splint and said, get to call him, go see the, uh, the um, orthopedist. Well, the orthopedist was very, very busy and it was two or three weeks before she showed up and didn't return for two weeks. And she still got elbow pain. Uh-oh, what's going on here? Can you see what's going on? The radial head is not in line with the capital. That's right. It's sublux posterior. <coughs> and so an initial diagnosis of the proximal radial has sublux posterior. So now she's demonstrated also, because it's posterior, it's pressing against the posterior interosseous nerve. So that tells you she's got some problems, right? Yes, sir. <coughs> so she was under examination and found to be unstable. So what are you going to do? That radial head fracture. Is that is that the reason she's unstable? I don't, so. I don't think so. Well, let's see here. An open reduction was performed, and here you can see there's incongruity of the surfaces, well visualized, and then it was uh, secured with very minimal, many transepiphyseal screws. In six weeks post-op, here you can see the screws, and you can see that the fracture is anatomic and appears healed. And here she is six weeks post-op, and she's got almost equal motion here, almost equal, and it's certainly functional. So the real question is, did the radial head alone 
cause the elbow dis disability, instability. Is that why she was unstable, because the radial head is broken? I don't, I don't think so. So what do you need to look for? Why, why isn't she unstable? What other, you yeah, know? There you, may have been an unappreciated ulna fracture. No. Or LUCL injury or something. Yeah, right. You need to look at the soft tissue. And usually there is usually some posterior lateral ligamentous instability associated with radial head fracture. And the collateral ligament must be reattached. And we did do this when we saw her and we tied it back down and reattached it. And so with fractures of the radial head, often the radial collateral ligament is a vault from the lateral epicondyle. And this was if you look at some of the literature, especially in the adults, they have a high instance associated with fractures of the with injuries to the lateral collateral ligaments. You know, we don't see in children because they have it's mostly cartilage. We don't see many radial head fractures. They're usually radial neck fractures and then the metaphysis. And this was in this article here by associated injuries, and this was by Dr. Rye and our friend one of our staff people, Dr. Mori. And so here's the mechanism of radial head fracture. They usually get a posterior displacement with the elbow flexed, and the radial head gives way, and so that allows it to go posterior, and when it does that, it tells, takes off the lateral collateral ligaments. So when you have a radial head fracture, the thing that may be hidden that you need to repair is that lateral collateral ligament. And that's why she was unstable. It wasn't the radial head that was giving her stability, it was the collateral ligaments. So the message is, look beyond the bones, look at some of the soft tissues. So, radial head fractures always assess the integrity of both the lateral and lower collateral ligaments. So this is the take home message of this. So what are the major areas that lead to unrecognized fractures? Well, first and foremost, a failure to promote a complete history and physical exam. You need to, people come in and the emergency room has made a diagnosis and you come in and you agree with it and you say, let's go ahead and we'll get them to the operating room and you don't do a good physical. And you look at the radiographs first, this is causing you to focus on the management of the major fracture pattern. So the rule is, you go to the emergency room he tells you what, well, guys, you kind of put that in your back of your mind, and the next thing you do is what? Examine the page. You get a history and examination. And then always check for ipsilateral injuries. And then remember, in the upper extremity, you always start at the navicular and go all the way up to the sternoclavicular joint in the involved extremity. And there's, you really need to have an appreciation of the normal ossification of the joints, especially about the elbow. So, here's the message here. You know, warning, you know, the things may look quiet and serene, but you need to be vigilant or you'll get caught with your pants down. <laughs> <laughs> so, with all these modules, I, I want to thank you for letting me be a part of the educational process. Thank you very much.